let's talk about Scotland. Known for its kilts, bagpipes, haggis, and uh, tropical real estate dreams, it's the late 17th century, and Scotland is jealous of their English neighbors, who are making bank in the colonialism game, and the Scots were very eager to get in on this. This was because Scotland was in a shite position economically. They had long been an agricultural country, with its economy heavily dependent on farming. This put them at a disadvantage when compared to their wealthier neighbor, England, which had a more diversified economy with thriving trade and manufacturing sectors. To make matters worse, Scotland had been hit hard by the Little Ice Age, a period of cooling temperatures. Poor weather conditions led to several failed harvests, famine was common, and the population was suffering. So now, they've got a dream to become an economic powerhouse, and all they need is a genius plan, which was copying the English and doing a little colonizing. The Company of Scotland was chartered with the intent to trade in Africa and the Indies. Issue is, England exists, and the East India Company had exactly zero interest in sharing their tasty leaves with any competitors, and through some machinations, managed to block funding for any such project by the Scots. But that's fine, the Scots think. A trimmed-down mission will do. So now it was just the Company of Scotland for trading to Africa, and they still managed to raise a significant amount of cash, despite the population being mostly broke. £400,000 was invested in a matter of weeks. That might not sound like a lot now, but the total amount of capital in Scotland at the time was estimated on the order of £2 million. In other words, 20% of all available money in Scotland was marked for the project. When one-fifth of an entire country's capital is invested in a scheme, one would expect that said scheme would not immediately change in every detail. But enter William Patterson. Patterson was a big deal, a slave trading co-founder of the Bank of England. So probably not a good fella, but he was rich so people thought he must have been doing something right. He proposes that if Scotland just colonized a strategic wee bit of Central America, specifically on the Isthmus of Panama, known then as the Darien Isthmus, they could become rich just like the English. The idea here is that the English and Dutch controlled the route to the East Indies at the time. This route involved a long trip down Africa's Atlantic coast, around the Cape of Good Hope, and up through the Indian Ocean. But a simple look at the map gave another possibility. Go west. Yet the Isthmus of Darien, for some reason not yet properly colonized by the Spanish, was narrow enough to transport goods over land. If rival powers just controlled the eastern route, Scotland could make their own westward one. Plus, Patterson throws in a ton of platitudes, like how Darien had such a nice temperate climate, with cool animals like turtles and abundant fruit growing spontaneously everywhere. Plus, it was supposed to have great soil for farming. And Scotland's like, great idea, Billy boy, what could possibly go wrong? Well, a lot. So, in 1698, five ships carrying about 1,200 settlers set sail to found the colony of New Caledonia. Picture a bunch of kilted Scots used to the rainy highlands, suddenly dropped in a tropical jungle. Darien was less the beach paradise they imagined, and more of a mosquito mansion. Considering how most Scots can't survive past 70 Fahrenheit slash 20 Celsius, it's a miracle that they didn't just pack up and leave immediately. The settlers get to work building a fort and some huts, not realizing that they are sitting on a ticking time bomb of calamity. Disease quickly sweeps through the settlement. Malaria, oh. yellow fever, you name it. Plus, they brought the wrong kind of crops, and their supplies dwindled rapidly. But don't worry, it gets worse. Remember how this colony was supposed to control trade routes? Yeah, Spain wasn't thrilled about that. Plus, even though they did not inhabit the land due to it being a mosquito-infested hellhole, that still didn't mean they didn't claim it. So they set up a blockade, cutting off supplies and potential escape. The English and Dutch even refused to trade with the Scots due to not wanting to piss off Spain. Attempts at trading with the native Kuna people also failed, due to the Scots mostly only having heavy woolen fabrics and combs to trade, which people living in a hot and humid swamp generally don't need. So things eventually begin to collapse. A few desperate survivors managed to escape back to Scotland, bringing tales of the disastrous venture. But this was too late and a second expedition was launched. So imagine the second group's surprise when they find the remnants of a failed settlement. Not exactly the thriving tropical paradise they signed up for. And since the second expedition thought that they were just resupplying a thriving colony, they were not equipped to basically start over again like what was needed. Eventually, the remaining settlers abandoned the colony. The Darien scheme didn't just fail. It left Scotland in financial ruin. The Scots had invested between a quarter to half of all the money circulating in their country into this venture. 
putting all their eggs into one very risky tropical basket. In the aftermath, Scotland's economy tanked, poverty was widespread, and people were understandably upset. Meanwhile, England, Scotland's neighbor to the south, was emerging as a dominant global power. The English, seeing Scotland in a vulnerable state, saw an opportunity. They offered to bail out the Scottish investors who had lost their kilts in the Darien disaster. This generous offer, however, had a catch. In return for the bailout, England wanted Scotland to agree to the Act of Union. This would dissolve the Scottish Parliament and combine England and Scotland into a single entity known as Great Britain. Many Scots were against the Union as it would mean losing their national sovereignty. But the country was in a dire situation. But ultimately, the decision fell to the nobles and landlords who controlled the Scottish Parliament. This included a certain Mr. Patterson, who came crawling back to Scotland after the Darien colony's collapse. In 1707, the Act of Union was signed, marking the end of Scotland as an independent nation. Scotland and England became part of the United Kingdom, and the Scottish Parliament was dissolved. Scotland also got to benefit from being able to access England's global trade network and colonies. Over time, Scotland recovered from the financial disaster of the Darien scheme, but at the cost of its independence. Now, was this union good or not for Scotland? Well, I'm an American, so I don't really know, but I'm sure there'll be a very healthy and civil debate in the comments over this. An interesting factoid is that to this day, the Darien Isthmus is still not inhabited, and no roads reach the bay where the original settlement was built. The hostility of this area to human life also means that there is no road connection between North and South America due to this relatively small piece of land just not being worth the trouble even with modern technology.